you're not sure exactly who you're going to have available at, at maybe a receiver and even on the O line, you just kind of prepare and try to get everybody involved and whoever's available plays. Yeah, we've had some good practice at that this year. You know, it's uh, it's just got to be that prepare with the guys that are here at practice and the guys that are available now. And then, you know, whoever they tell us we have on Sunday, uh, you know, we'll trot them out there. When you're calling plays throughout a game, how do you find a balance between, you know, in any given situation, here's the best play for this second and three or whatever, versus trying to – have some kind of through line and, and seeing to the end of the game and I guess doing things to set up things later on. Yeah, I think there's definitely a balance of, of that mixture, you know, and I think that you want to set some things up. Sometimes you're excited to get something called that you've, you know, kind of set up with a couple of calls earlier in the game. Uh, and so you're looking for an opportunity to do that. And then there are times, uh, a lot of times, particularly where we've been personnel wise some this year where you have to consider game management. And, you know, I think back to even the Jacksonville game and not uh, doing anything to put the ball in harm's way because our defense was playing lights out. So I think that all, uh, you know, kind of plays into it. And, and certainly it's a ebb and flow throughout the game. There's communication with Coach Vrabel, communication with the rest of the offensive staff, and, and that's kind of how you build it. You had a, it was, I think it was like a third and 16 on that first series, and you called a, a draw. Was that what you would uh, consider game management there? Yeah, I don't, you know, with where we're at, uh, with some personnel things, didn't think it was a great idea to say, hey, let's drop back, hang on to the ball as long as we can, and see how fast Joey Bosa can get in the backfield. You know? <laughs> Basketball, when a guy gets a hot hand, they make a concerted effort to get him the ball so he can keep shooting. Do you do that in your play calling when a guy gets in a groove like A.J. was in the second half against the 49ers? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, A.J. is one of those guys uh, you kept uh, basketball terms, uh, you know, I'd say he's a volume shooter. You know, <laughs> he's a guy that, uh, you know, you, you certainly want to give as many opportunities uh, as you can. My son loves Steph Curry, so I'm all about the basketball analogies, if, if uh, you can't tell. But, um, you know, I, I think with a guy like him, uh, you know, as, as he gets going and kind of feels that momentum, uh, that confidence kind of builds. And I would say that, uh, you know, when you feel a, a player of AJ's caliber getting into a groove, it certainly gives you confidence as a play caller to find, uh, you know, find ways to highlight some plays for him for sure. How much did to kind of, you know, get downfield a little bit, open up the, the whole offense for you guys? Yeah, I think, you know, anytime you have that kind of vertical threat on the outside, it's it's going to help. You know, some of the uh, conversions on, on the inside throws to Nick and things of that nature, you know, when you're getting the defense to expand and making that umbrella open, you know, it's going to help things. Um, and, and we expect that whether it's AJ or anybody else, you know, we got to be a, a vertical threat uh, offense and, and make them defend the whole field. Yeah, your defense obviously has just been – red hot on their winning streak. What do you see from them? Obviously, they like to blitz a lot and they cause a lot of turnovers as well. Yeah, they're very multiple group. You know, they have a lot of different looks. They're extremely well coached and you can tell that they're great situationally uh, and that they're prepared for the different things that an offense may uh, go to as a counterpunch. Uh, you know, and so we need to be very detailed. We need to be thorough in, in our rules, our protection rules, our run game rules, all those things. And then we just got to go win some one-on-one -on -one matchups. You know, and that's, uh, I think, the name of the game is can we get open faster than their pass rush gets there? Can we push piles more than, uh, than they can push piles backwards? So uh, it's going to be a fun challenge for us. We're looking forward to it. Third and long last last week. What allowed that to happen, and how do you kind of sustain that? Yeah, it all starts with protection. You look at those third and long conversions, and they all started with a great pocket, a clean pocket where Ryan could step up uh, and deliver a ball. You know, with with as much velocity as he needed to on it. You know, and and so it all starts there. A big credit to those guys up front, and the tight ends who stepped in and and did a nice job in the protection adjustments we asked them to do. Then of course it, it goes back to earlier saying the, the vertical stretch and, and you know opening up those safeties a little bit, getting people to uh, play with some depth in their vision drops and and uh, and Ryan making good decisions with the football. So is it, is it safe to say that Ryan has like a different level of confidence when AJ Brown is, is on the field with him? It, it seemed like you know some of the throws he was making were the ones that are reminiscent of 2020 and 2019. You know, I've, I've always operated under the assumption that confidence is built off repeated action, right? And so when you get opportunities to work with guys, as many reps as he has throwing those, those routes full speed to AJ, um, you know, although we haven't had as many lately, in practice, you know, he knows where AJ is going to be coming out of a strike route. He knows where AJ is going to be if he 
uh, you know, gives them a chance at a jump ball or a back shoulder ball, you know. So uh, there's a, a lot of uh, logged reps and banked reps there. Uh, and so that's where I think you see that confidence coming from. And I, I agree. I think it does look different when we're throwing on time and we're cutting it loose to a spot and, and we're getting open physically and with speed. You know, I, I agree there is a different look to it. Offense overall, because like you see him, he'll catch a ball, he gets up, you know, you, you have uh, some emotion being shown. Does that kind of add like a degree of juice to the whole unit? Absolutely. I think anybody that goes and makes plays, you know, I, I think back to the New England game, and although the result of the game wasn't what we wanted, Dontrell popped that long run, and you saw our bench explode, you know, and that's uh, – that's what this game's all about. Guys getting out the opportunity to make plays, and when they go and make them, it fires everybody up. I, mean, I would think if I was playing offensive line, which I never have, but if I were protecting for the quarterback and heard the roar of the crowd because my sustained block and the good pocket we provided helped him make the play, that'd fire me up. Dylan played a little bit here and there, but nothing like he did on Thursday. Did a part of you wonder how he would do, and how did he kind of handle it from the time he was told he's going to be the starter? and just how his, he handled his disposition all the way through. Yeah, it was a unique situation from a timing standpoint because some of those you know personnel challenges happened on a, on a short week. But I've watched Dylan prepare, and I know how hard he's worked. I know how hard Keith and, and Sully have, have worked with him and you know kept him in tune to the game plans at multiple positions. And so I was excited for his opportunity. You know, of course, there's an element you're not sure what it's going to look like in, in uh, you know, real time. But, you know, I was confident that he was going to go out there and, and give great effort uh, and great energy. Derek Henry out. Um, has it been kind of the best case scenario with these backs that have stepped up, uh, especially a guy like Foreman, who, who has just such grit to him when he's out on the field? Yeah, I don't know that there is a best case scenario to losing Derek, but uh, – I, I certainly am proud of the way those guys have handled it. Yeah, so having a having a guy uh, like Foreman that's able to handle some of the heavier lifting stuff, and then having a counter punch with Dontrell, um, you know, ha, has been great. And it's a testament to those guys how hard they've worked, and and Tony Dews for getting them prepared as well as he has. Um, but yeah, we're fortunate to have those guys. Back on Dylan for a minute. Did it, did he play well enough uh, Thursday night that maybe he's moved up a little bit in the pecking order, and you guys are a little more confident in? putting him in if he has to plug into another position with like with Nate still on the COVID list? You know, I think as, as much as the season ebbs and flows, it's a little dangerous to, to, you know, get too into pecking orders. I would say he certainly didn't hurt himself. You know, he, uh, he instilled, you know, a lot of confidence in those around him out there uh, and guys that, you know, hadn't uh, worked with him before. So, you know, he, he helped himself from a, a confidence standpoint and uh, certainly the staff feels great about him. As coach to do on the play where they jump off sides, you know, what's the receiver supposed to do there? Maybe what's Ryan supposed to do? Obviously, that worked out well. And how, how good was it to see that maybe executed on what could have been a giveaway, giveaway down? Yeah, they're supposed to do exactly what they did. <laughs> <laughs> exactly what they did, just how we drew it up. Uh, I, you know, without getting uh, too into, you know, scheme and particulars, um, you know, you, you obviously want to take advantage if you feel like you have a free play, and, and we did. You know, your meetings with Ryan this week, obviously going against his former team. Have you like sensed any elevated focus or any, you know, a different excitement or anything going against? Him? Honestly, zero. Uh, Ryan's so focused on the task at hand each and every week. It's one of the most impressive things about his professionalism. I haven't even heard him reference former teammates or any of that stuff. He's just focused on, you know, what we need to do schematically to get this W. Where Julio and AJ and Ferks are, are on the sideline, do you worry that it keys a defense too much into the probability of that being a run? Yeah, I think you have to be in tune to you know all sorts of personnel tendencies. Um, we've been in some unique scenarios from our personnel groups this year, so uh, I would imagine those that are breaking us down are having a little bit of a tough time figuring out you know exactly why we were in certain groupings uh, and all that. But we we track that and we you know try to take advantage of any glaring um, you know tendencies that we have. If you ever met John Madden, but during your time with the Raiders, could you kind of sense his presence on that organization and what were your thoughts about maybe what he meant to the to the league. Yeah, I was very fortunate to spend a, a couple of different days um, around Coach Madden. Played in uh, a bocce ball tournament, a charity uh, bocce ball event with him uh, when I was out in the Bay Area. Uh, and just a wonderful, wonderful man. He, you know, there are few people you come across in your life that just kind of light up the room and everybody gravitates to them and they can't wait to hear their stories and they can't wait to get a little anecdote. 
uh, and, and he was one of those people. And so I feel very fortunate for my time around Coach Madden and, and just the uh, hearing the stories he had to share and, uh, you know, being a part of, uh, of that history out there. So.